Hello everyone. Welcome to episode three of Conversations About Color. Really excited to have you all joining us today. For those of you that are new, hi Javeria. Um, those that are returning, welcome. I hope you've been enjoying this series. Um, Seema, Samia, Nora, Vinny, how are you all? Make sure you give us a wave and say hello. Um, and if you have any questions, post them in the questions box uh, right at the bottom there. We will try to get through everyone's questions. A lot of times during these conversations, we end up answering some of the questions as we're having our talk. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to cover everything. And i um, really excited to have an amazing, amazing guest with us today. And you are gonna love hearing from her. I am uh, fortunate to call her my friend and she's a leader like no other. Um, so just wanna introduce myself formally to those of you who don't know me. My name is Dr. Uzma Syed. I'm an infectious disease physician in New York. Um, and I often talk about my career and, uh, you know, given that we're in the current pandemic with COVID-19, so I uh, frequently talk about that. Uh, but I have a lot of other passion projects that I'm very much actively involved in, uh, develop, uh, devote a lot of my time to the youth um, and to mentorship. I have a nonprofit called the Linus, um, you know, which I uh, is focused on career development for high school students. And um, Assemblywoman Taylor Rayner is actually, Taylor Darling is actually one of our um, mentors as well. So I'm really excited to be introducing you to her shortly. And let's go ahead and get Taylor on our conversation here. Hi, Wasia. Amtul, hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, Taylor. Oh, how are you? Oh, my goodness. I am just leaving a huge protest in Hempstead, so I have no voice, but uh, the people needed me, so I went to where the people were, and it seems like we are making a huge move on our police reform package, so this is amazing. Uh, really you know, this is what we want to see. We want to see you in action. You know, this is what you do. You are our leader in so many ways. <laughs> This is I feel like Crocodile Dundee right now, and I look... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you look fabulous. Thank you me. always look fabulous. So we're very excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, I wanted to formally introduce you to everyone. We have a lot of viewers with us here today, and a lot more are going to be joining in. And I, I really want to do a, a formal introduction because, you know, there is so much um, that people need to know about you. And before we get started, I'll just say that Taylor Darling is an American and British citizen who was born in Brooklyn. Her father served in the military, and her mother devoted her life to law, justice, and education. During her early childhood, Taylor, along with her sister, Sydney, lived in Europe with her parents. Taylor learned the game of chess around age four. She and her sister became nationally ranked chess players who practiced and competed seven days a week. Taylor credits the game for developing her strategic approach to problem solving. In an effort to increase the amount of healthy two-parent households in America, Taylor devoted her life to the field of psychology. She attended Spelman at the young age of 16 and was accepted into clinical psychology doctoral programs at the young age of 19. Taylor eventually transferred to Hofstra and became an industrial and organizational psychologist. Her holistic and humanistic approach kept her in high demand in the private sector. However, the growing needs of her community began to require her attention. And Taylor's sister soon gave her the challenge and said, you get paid to fix things, fix our community. It was then that her path to public service began. Taylor is a crusader for inclusion, equity, economic, and social justice. She leads with transparency, strategic efficiency, simplicity, and curiosity. And that's just a little snippet of what you're actually about. So I just want to say, Taylor, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for everything that you do. And we're so excited to have you here for our conversation about you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I, I really feel like I am the luckiest woman in the world to be able to represent such a diverse um, community in Nassau County. And I, I promise you, I was just telling someone, I don't even know what the word board means anymore. Like, I don't, I don't think I have a, a second in my life that's not value added because there's so much work to be done and we're doing it. And it's just like, it's the best feeling in the world. And then that's amazing. That's what we see really in true leadership. So Taylor, I just want to ask you quickly, are you getting an echo on your end? 
Um, I probably could. I'm not getting an echo on my end. Okay, I just want to make sure that it's clear to the audience as well, because there's a little bit of an echo uh, on this end. I just want to make sure everyone can hear us nice and clear. Uh, everyone who's on with us, just give us a wave and thumbs up if you can hear us perfectly well. Great. Awesome. So Taylor, we just heard all of that. Um, you know, there is a little bit that says there's an echo. Hopefully it clears up um, as we go. But we heard a wonderful thing about your background. I, I just want to start off by, you know, you sharing with us um, a little bit of inf more information about your childhood. You know, we heard a little bit that, you know, you lived in Europe, you lived in the U.S. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about what your childhood was like with your sister and your parents. <coughs> um, it was... Um... It was really an amazing experience. We we moved like a quartet. You know, there was a, a mother and father who truly loved each other, which parents, we can buy our kids everything they want in the world. The best gift that you can give to your children is loving the other parent. That is that is something that really demonstrates the child was born out of love and they were wanted and desired. And And my sister and I are so blessed to have had those two beautiful angels as our parents who were community focused and, and really enjoyed each other and enjoyed being members of, of this beautiful black community, this black family, and, and, and just really working to end so many atrocities we saw in Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, living in communities and, and just situations that were okay for some children, but, but our children just really seemed so vulnerable and our, 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 our family dynamics seemed so vulnerable and it was really just something you were meant to sit with, you know? Um, so, so that was, that was a, a lot of So it seems like, you know, activism was really, you know, ingrained in you at a very young age. Uh, you know, would you say that from a very young age, you were essentially the environment on the home front was promoting that. And so your parents sort of uh, taught you to really, you know, uphold certain values and speak up for people. Is that, is that how it was? Definitely. Um, they love the news and they love Jeopardy and Scrabble. And um, so we, we, we would talk about current events. And, and my father never talked at us. He always spoke with us. And uh, he was much more hands-on applied parenting. So if we were curious about how to iron, we would eventually be ironing. Like that was how, how he parented. And um, so we would speak about different things. And I would see what would upset my parents. I would see what would hurt my parents. And it always surrounded how we treated each other in humanity. They were humanist and, and um, just, just two of the most loving, um, uh, hardworking people I know. And my father was our chess coach, our chess team, which, which was filled with people who had, you know, modified households. They, uh, they came 14th in the nation in the 1994 chess nationals. And these were, these were children my father was with all day. He was like a member of our PTA and, and so many people, you know, did not maybe have the structure where they had two parents at home. So it just meant so much more that my childhood was able to help other childhoods. So, you know, it's just, it's just something about the, the togetherness that, that our community has, but, but we're not always aware of and we don't always celebrate, you know, there is still that sense of community where, where our children are, are all children that matter. But my parents really, I mean, this was all they did. All they did was help people and improve systems that, that people feel will never change. That's amazing. How old were you when you moved from Europe? And I'm assuming you were in Brooklyn for a majority um, of your life, or did you move around in the U.S. as well? Yeah, so we, um, I was about five when we moved back to this country once my father became ill um, while serving in the military. And my mother, of course, wanted him to have the best care possible, one of that family support. So we moved from Germany. My sister was born. She was very young. I was about five. And um, <laughs> Germany from bed -style. Two very different planets. <laughs> I won't even say we're all. So um, I think I was still wearing dresses to yodel in. I don't even know. But I just, that style was just this, this, this crazy place. So I just, um, just was like, what you say? Oh, excuse me. One second. I'm sorry. Sure. Sure. No problem. I hate I'm so, so sorry. Um, so that's perfectly <laughs> fine. But um, bed to, to Germ Germany to bed was probably the hardest transition. And then, unfortunately, we lost my father because he did become ill while serving in the military. So around 10 or 11, 11, I, we moved to Hempstead, Long Island. And then I went to college at 16 in Atlanta, Georgia. So I spent okay. so different you developmental states, Brooklyn, Long Island, and Atlanta. So Right. 
So now you were quite young when you moved from Europe, but you know, still being five and that transition is quite a stark transition, as you mentioned, and I'm sure you have some vivid memories. Um, do you recall a time that you might have, you know, faced any type of prejudice or racism before, you know, while you were in Germany oh, and yeah. at that young age? My mom, my mom tells me this story all the time. She says we were at a playground and um, there were these blonde little boys playing and I wanted to go play with them. And she said they started pointing at me and laughing, like, at my skin and saying, like, derogatory terms um, in German, which my mother did speak. And my mom was just like, she just felt like at the time a movement was coming. This was the late 80s, so my father's illness was very much in line with where she was seeing uh, the area in Germany we lived in going. She just said, I literally was alone. Like, I was like an isolated child because, you know, we're taught that dark skin is not beautiful. That's not a good color. That's not a safe color. And we don't like what's different, you know. Um, and it was really young. I was five, five, um, four or five, so pretty young. And how about when you then moved to Brooklyn um, at that age and then you were transitioning? I mean, that's a really tough age and a tough time to transition. It's sort of like a culture shock because you're going from completely different cultural environments. Um, and now I don't know if your environment that you were in was more diverse than where you came from, um, or there were a new set of challenges that you were having, not just transitioning in a new country, but adapting to a new culture. Exactly. Um, the transition was hard because I was speaking German and English at the time, and I definitely spoke different than my dad. Like, then, like, or my dad and I spoke different than most of my cousins. So they would do this thing where they would say, you know, oh, um, speak like a white girl, and her, their friends would come over and listen to me speak because that's what they said I spoke like. It was like, oh, she's different. Like, you know, for, for parties, my cousins are getting, like, custom leather outfits made that were, um, you know, I guess really in in the 80s. And we're wearing, like, you know, dresses made by Hasidic Jews because that, that was, like, the quality my mother was used to coming from Germany. And she always made sure we had the best quality. So so I'm just, like, you know, um, I'm just – it was just it was just really, really hard. I, I, I spent a lot of time not fitting in in any world. So it was, just, it, was it was hard. And did you feel like as you were getting older, you know, throughout your childhood from, you know, elementary school to middle school, then high school, did it ever become easier or were the challenges just different at every stage? I just felt like there was just a lot of segregation, you know, um, whereas I was usually in school that were predominantly minority, there would still be, you know, like maybe four or five Asian kids and four or five Caucasian kids, but it, it was still just a segregation. So you live in this bubble of these cultures that just exist next to each other. There's no integration except for like, say, at the mall or the beach or anything like that. So it's just like, you know, just, just live in this world where we live in our own world and until we're forced to kind of be in each other's faces, like at NISMA or something, where all the schools come together and you're seeing the difference in the quality of instruments you're seeing the difference in the song selection and all these other things and it's like we're all just living in these little subcultures and there's no real integration especially here in the island absolutely now speaking of nisma and chess and all these other extracurricular activities that you had as you're growing up and you know experiencing normal childhood with all of these activities you yourself mentioned that you're now interacting with people of different cultures um did you have um, instances where you were, you know, where there was prejudice um, against you in these, you know, in a sort of like if you take a competition, for an example, you know, whether it be a peer, whether it be a judge, whether it be a parent, was there a particular time where you felt that there was, you know, um, injustice, inequality? Oh, 100 percent. I would say playing chess. It was really, really, really evident. They would call my name and my parents I put a lot of thought into my name because they knew that we're living in a world that accepts certain things and they wanted to, um, you know, they wanted us to have a chance with a resume. They wanted us to have a chance with our names. So our names were, were very thought about. So the name is an androgynous name. You know, you can't tell the religion, the, the, the sex, the anything, the race, Taylor could be anybody, you know? So they would always say, Mr. Taylor, Bertley, that was my maiden name. Or they would say, uh, they would send even my national reader card. It says I'm a girl. I would get all this mail as Mister. They'd be like, "Oh, well, he come up and get his trophy." When I would get trophies, it'd be the worst because you come up and they would look disappointed. Like, damn, they're letting black girls win now. Like, or like if I had to play against a Russian guy, a Russian young, young child, and their father would see, it was always that you lost to a black girl. It was always that. So chess, I would say, really was one of those those avenues and platforms where. We were the minority, for real, for real, on a lot of different levels. And then 
you know, because we definitely shouldn't be smart enough to be able to, to play this game that Masters play, but we did and we won and people were really upset about it. So if you are a, you know, you said, we, we heard that you started playing chess at uh, age four and obviously that continued. So at that young age, when you are seeing and living through this, that you are having this victorious moment, you're going up to accept, you know, your trophy and you're having that sense of, you know, um, whether it be a look or this, you know, uh, you know, puzzlement from these other people, what kinds of conversations did you have with your parents, you know, on the car ride home, on the walk home, on the, you know, walk out of the building, you know, was there a time that you remember, you know, realizing that there was, you know, these inequalities or these behaviors? Um, and did you have those conversations? Oh, definitely. Um, when I, I remember one of the one of the earliest times I was playing chess, because we, we my father was our chess coach, but he would always pair us with different masters. So we could learn mm -hmm. different perspectives of the game, different strategies of the game. And um, we would go into Brighton Beach and play with Russian often and we would we would go we'd sit there and we'd see them turning red if they were losing or if they maybe um underestimated us which often happened and um, one time i was kicking shin and i remember my mom saying and you kick him the hell back you don't want anybody kick you and i said okay are we playing chess or am i in um <laughs> an mma fighter but my mom taught me something very early on this world is going to treat you like that. They're going to try to kick you. And sometimes you have to remind them of who you are. And, um, and, and I saw that so early with that game. Wow. Wow. And, you know, it seems like you had to learn really tough lessons at a very young age um, and, you know, really go into survival mode. Did you have similar experiences as you got older? Um, you know, especially that, you know, you, are quite bright. You graduated high school early and started college early at the young age of 16. Um, that in itself is really challenging for a teenager. You know, there's so many challenges that come up with, you know, accelerating out of high school and being thrown into a college environment with older students and that whole adjustment. Yeah. Now, you know, if you throw in, um, you know, race and inequality on top of that, were, were those challenges that you really struggled with? What, explain to us how um, your college transition was. Oh, yeah, th th there were definitely challenges because, you know, you think when you're a woman of color and you're black that you're black, but you're, you don't really know how black you are until you're at an all black school. <laughs> that lets you know how black you are. Like if a song comes on, there's one there's one experience and one response. And as a black person, you should know that you should know how to play spades. You should know how to do this. You should know how to do that. There are things that black people should just know how to do. And I got to Spelman. That was my dream school for all girls, all these beautiful black princesses. And I, I get there and I'm like, goodness, I really don't feel that black. I mean, they're quoting like just black culture, which is which is so much of everybody's culture. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, Jesus, I don't know if I'm black enough. But being from New York, you get a bunch of brownie points anyway. So <laughs> So that was a, a, different, a different transition for you as well. And, you know, the whole time that you were there, did you feel so, you know, I talk about this often that there's, you know, inequalities and, you know, uh, prejudices both outside and within our communities. So that's sort of a prime example of that, that there was a constant struggle, even within, you know, an environment where you should have felt more comfortable, where you now had to deal with a, a different set of struggles. Yeah. Um, and is there something that, you know, helped you through that time? You know, prayer, my faith, um, being comfortable with who I am. I'm going to tell all the parents listening, confidence. You know, you owe whoever gives you confidence everything in life. My parents did not just say I could do anything. They fully supported and endorsed that belief. They breathed that belief. They spoke that belief. They, they moved with that belief. So when my sister challenged me to run for office and I didn't even know, I never even heard of Assemblywoman, I said, yes, I can. You know, and... Um, Listen, there's nothing more important that you can give your children than confidence. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. Doing. And that's spot on. You know, it really starts uh, on the home front. Um, when did you decide you wanted to go into psychology? Oh, very early on. Um, I'm, I'm a Scorpio. So we're naturally very intuitive and people don't understand it sometimes. So they like to use the word crazy at times. But um, that's not what I say. <laughs> so I really <laughs> like I want to know why humans do what they do. That's the big mystery in life. And I love them. And I want to promote more healthy two-parent households. So that's when I knew I wanted psychology because I had that. And when my father died when I was 10, I said, you know what? This is going to be a very different world for me. And it was and it is and it will always be. Um, 
those 10 years shaped my whole entire life pretty much. But, um, but, but yeah, so it's just, you know, it's one of those things where you just say, why, why do humans do what they do? And psychology really allowed me to, to uh, deal with those things like grief and, and other things. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But throughout your journey from undergrad and even into Hofstra, did you feel like there were a different set of challenges where, you know, certain doors were closing for you, where you were denied access to anything, where you were ever told that this may not be the right path for you, may not be the right fit for you? Did you feel like you had to prove yourself um, constantly or was it, you know, a seamless sort of transition? It was pretty seamless. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because what happens to, um, what happens to black people is if you become a black person that make white people feel comfortable and speak like they speak, you'd be shocked. I might even have more privilege sometimes because it's like, oh my God, we could hit, we could hit um, like, uh, you know, two or three things. We have a person of color, we have a woman that's a double minority and we actually like her. Give us 10 more of her. So I've had almost, I think more doors open because of that. Like, I feel like if I was five shades lighter, I would not have won my assembly race. Like my complexion and what I look like has actually opened doors for me because I am one of the ones they feel comfortable with. Um, I'm going to share something with you that, that really breaks my heart every time I say it. I've had other elected officials come to me and say, I am so happy they found you because there were no qualified candidates to run for office in District 18. And I said, how, how could someone think that? Do you know what we pay for in taxes? Like, we're, we're smart enough to pay taxes, right? But we're too yep. dumb to run for an office that only requires you to be 18 and prove your residence. How dare you? We are only people who matter when it comes to money. And I'm sure we pay for a lot of other neighborhoods to be a lot better than neighborhoods we live in. And, it, and it's disgusting. It's disgusting here in Nassau County. It really is. And that's why I don't like to that token girl that people feel comfortable with. Because I don't make them feel uncomfortable because that's not my style of thought to do things different not better but different because i need to stay at these tables because i have to keep fighting for people who who first we have to acknowledge as people dr saeed that's where we are absolutely absolutely i think what you just said here is so important so essentially you know your path you know you chose the path of being sort of part of the establishment having the seat at the table to enact change and, you know, I can see, you know, you're such a strong leader and you've done so much already in the amount of time that you've been in office. Um, going back to the time when you had decided to run for office and, you know, we heard that your sister was the one that, you know, really challenged you and said, you know, time to make change um, in our own community, you know, right where we live. That's that's what matters most. And, you know, you went ahead and and took that challenge. You know, walk us through a little bit about uh, through what your campaign trail was like. I mean, these are new, completely new territory that you are in. You're going from psychology now to government, you know, and, and uh, you know, service. Um, you know, it must have been, um, you know, a whole new set of challenges. Oh, it was a whole new world. <laughs> um, the day after I did not run, my client hired me promptly. Um, so now uh, my savings is gone. I have no money to live, but I also have to find money to run a race. And I still don't have a job description for this race. I don't know what it entails. I know very little about the community and the politics here. But I do know I was ready to pack my bags and move the hell out of here because it had become so dismal. And my pockets were saying I was living in a great environment, but my environment was saying I was being ripped off. So I said, you know what? That's a dummy move to stay in that type of place. But um, God had a greater plan for me. He said, no, 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 before you try to hot tail out of here, you stay here and fix it. Because when you were 10 and you moved here, you asked your parents, you moved to Garden City because you didn't like what Hempstead looked like. And what my mother said was, you don't have a job, so you, you don't have a say in what we buy. But also, if you don't like Hempstead, you go fix Hempstead. And that's what I do every day at the sacrifice of my sanity, my family, my, my peace that I will never have because I am now aware of what is happening right next door to my house. And it is disgusting. Absolutely. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, your immediate family. I know because we're friends that you have a daughter. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about your childhood and the dynamics in your immediate household. How has been, uh, you know, how has it been for your daughter and her upbringing and her childhood, you know, from, you know, early on to even in today's, you know, um, day and climate and what we're facing, you know, what kinds of conversations have you had to have with her? Okay, so um, I married her father, 
who is a Morehouse man. So we have the Spellman Morehouse Connection, which is the Spellhouse Connection. Really big. They say more t people get married from our two schools than any other two schools in the country. So they have this little chapel devoted to it because they want us to keep sending our children there. So like a legacy builder, right? So she's a Spellhouse baby, and she's actually just been announced as valedictorian of her class this year. Um, she wow. was a cellist. And I have to say, she was the easiest child I could ever imagine from conception till now. Um, she's a little bit like Wednesday Adams sometimes, but she's a cancer. So but she is a, she's, her work ethic is second to none. She is so focused, maybe too focused. She is responsible. She is accountable. She is, uh, I just, I want to say responsible again, intelligent, beautiful, perfect body. I, I don't know how I got so blessed, but she is just such a gift. And I have a second daughter and she is very different. And I'll just say that about her. <laughs> So, you know, throughout, you know, their upbringing, you know, have there been different, uh, have you found yourself having the same kind of conversations that your mom um, had with you? Or has it been very different, you know, given that you've been, you know, they've been growing up in Long Island, essentially, um, with different, you know, environment, possibly different demographics, different challenges, or have you found yourself having the same kind of conversations with them? Same kind of conversations. Um, uh, my husband and I actually lived in Tribeca for two years. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that was a really interesting experience because they were really, my daughter and my daughter and niece were pretty much like the few minorities that were in the uh, schools. And I'm going to take almost Asians out of it, if, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. because it's where the Asian community, especially at that level, they're considered white. They, they're never, ever put in a different class that I've witnessed having my daughter in school mm -hmm. with them. So... So, um, you know, they'd be the only minorities. Um, you know, my, my daughter and niece actually had a teacher who started really treating her different from her peers and not being able to show any academic reason or behavioral experience as to why she started treating her different. And I actually heard them talking about the story two weeks ago. They said, remember that teacher in Tribeca who used to think everything you did was wrong and think you were so dumb and treated you so bad? And they're like, how many years ago was that? That it just... It was really a sad conversation, but I like the strength and their support of each other as they told that story. Thank God my daughter's never had to go into a school by herself. There's always been two of them um, because we, we need that. And that speaks to the organized unity that, that's needed to bring about that change that we need in our society. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank goodness they had each other. Um, now, talk to us a little bit about Nassau County, Long Island. You know, you've been in the system now, um, you know, advocating for the community and working so hard. You know, we know that, you know, we've known for many years how much racism is prevalent, even in Long Island, and how our community is unfortunately so divided. Um, you know, we all know about that Newsday article that came out that showed, you know, the complete disparities and the things, yep. things that were happening right, you know, it, right in front of our eyes, right in, in you know, our hometowns. Um, and, you know, what have you seen throughout, you know, your, your time in office? You know, what are, have you seen changes and lead us from the beginning to now? You know, what have you seen? Um, I have seen a lot of people tell me they always wanted to work with the leaders in Hempstead, but the leaders in Hempstead in that area refused to work with them. So they're happy they now have somebody that they can speak to about the issues they've worked so hard to fix in our community. So that's what it's like, hearing a bunch of that about 30 times. And then I guess once those layers are peeled, then it can be like, okay, she's kind of human. And she never makes me feel bad, but I'm always going to make my point. And that's something that people know. You'll know if I'm with you or you'll know if I'm not with it. And, and you'll know quickly. And I don't have to hurt or isolate while I do it. And that is my God-given gift. I wish more people had that gift. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that's where I'm at. That's, that's walking into a room where it's like, there's a black girl we can really deal with. We can get behind it. I've had someone ask, if we could find a couple more of you, we have some races coming up. It'd be great to be able to find some more of you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and how do you think, you know, we can overcome these challenges and these struggles that, you know, have been here for hundreds and hundreds of years? Policy reform and talks like this and talks with our friends and talks with different groups. And I don't know, integration beyond Roosevelt Field Mall. Absolutely. I mean, that is that is key, you know, and I think that's something that we see, unfortunately, so common um, throughout the country, um, these pockets and segregation amongst different communities. 
And we have it even within our immediate communities where we see, you know, there's subdivisions. Um, and that's where a lot of the problem gets rooted from, unfortunately. You know, the more that we can have mixing of communities of culture. I mean, New York is the classic example of that. You know, we call it the melting pot, you know, for that reason. We have the most amount of, you know, um, ethnicities here and we should be taking advantage of that. But for some reason, there's always this disconnect. And if you look at Long Island as a prime example of that, we have pockets of regions of different, you know, ethnicities and that doesn't help uh, the situation ever. It doesn't, it doesn't because I, I know people who have never spoken to a person of African descent or hadn't until they were 18 years old. Wow. And I have kids in Hempstead who have spent grade K through seven having classes solely in a trailer. They've never had class wow. in an actual brick and mortar building in Hempstead. Wow. That's heavy. Um, and you know, ha have you been speaking to the youth as well throughout all of this? And what is the consensus from them? I, I mean, I, I personally don't, but I would like you to tell the audience. Oh, um, you know, um, I'll speak about these, these beautiful young people that I've connected with recently, and they have become speakers in their own right about this, this movement. And they are taking that torch, and they came to me, and I came to them at the exact same time. So stars are aligning now. We're playing that catch-up game where we're catching our generations because this has to be repaired intergenerationally. Um, and um, so I've had a lot of that. And then recently I've been able to have an amazing men mentee through the Alinus uh, program run by the, uh, the beautiful Dr. Uzmasaid. It's been amazing. I've been able to speak with children that do not look like me that I don't think I've ever spoken to. That's, that's the, the best part of that program. I'm speaking to an Asian, that, a, a beautiful Asian young lady and I have each other's numbers and we text and we share things. That I have no other platform for that to happen except maybe with the nail tech, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, and you know we are really fortunate um, to have you as a leading mentor, and these students benefit so much from your guidance and from your mentorship. So I want to thank you again. Thank you for being selfless and giving your time. You know, I mean, it's so important because this is how we, you know, build bridges, and this is how we, uh, you know, counter what you know, unfortunately, the current narrative is in this country. Um, you know, what message would you like people to know about the current situation? Um, the current situation is going to be repaired with unified and organized pressure. That's it. And we're doing something like that with these worldwide global protests. We are about to pass a great package of policy reform legislation next week. We have enough votes in the Senate. If anyone is on my Instagram, I am Taylor Darling. You will see me jump about five feet in the air because I got the news with everyone else in the crowd at the protest, which is why I'm dressed like a bandit right now. Um, so, so, um, but, but yeah, be safe when you protest. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it's one of those things that I'm just like, this is, this is real life and history right now. I'm just like, like I never went to a protest in my life until this week. And I've been to like 12 of them. And I've spoken. I've supplied audio. I've danced. I've sang. I've cried. Like, this is my life now. I'm protesting. Because yeah. until these bills are passed, until we have some semblance of humanication, this is going to be bad. This is going to be really, really bad. So we need to get it together. Yeah, that's beautiful. And finally, I want everyone, um, I want you to leave everyone with, you know, three actionable items that people can take away from um, our conversation and from, you know, what we are dealing with right now. And what are three things that people can actually do um, to help? I would say vote, <laughs> donate, and love. And, and with that love, ask your loved ones what you can do to help. Exactly what you just did is what they can do. Ask, because that's gonna be different for every every beautiful minority that you know, that's gonna be different. That's beautiful. Well, I wanna thank you again from the bottom of our hearts, um, Assemblywoman Taylor Darling, representing the 18th District. We are so proud of you, so proud of everything you've done, everything that you've accomplished. And, you know, we're here for you. And, you know, we are just looking forward to a brighter future for all of us together. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care.